I'm Shachar Azani, and in the news, Israel's unity government collapsed and the country is headed to another round of elections. The Israeli Knesset dissolved Tuesday midnight as a legally mandated deadline to pass Israel's 2020 state budget expired, triggering a fourth election cycle in less than two years. The current Israeli government, a partnership between Netanyahu's Likud and Benny Gantz's Blue and White, was sworn in on May 17, 2020, only a few months ago. To discuss this seemingly never-ending political saga in Israel and the upcoming election is my dear friend, Yaakov Kobi Cohen. Kobi is an Israel educator, a social entrepreneur, a Zionist activist, podcaster, and political analyst and columnist. Kobi, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, and uh, I'm really glad to join you today. So let me first ask you, what happened? I mean, from what we understand, there was no vote of no confidence. The government just seems to collapse on its own. So it's not exactly that. Israel doesn't have a constitution like in the United States, but instead it has 14 uh, basic laws. One of those laws is the Knesset, the basic law of the Knesset. And technically the Knesset um, in a parliamentary system, just like in Israel, the Knesset is the one, the one that is actually passing the budget. And what happened was that every year, based on, the, based on that basic law, the, the Knesset need to uh, vote for the yearly budget. And if it doesn't vote for a budget, then the Knesset dissolves and you go to election. So when they signed the coalition agreement, the, the, par the partition, you know, uh, not partition. Uh, rotation. The rota yeah, let's say the agreement with the, with, between Kahol Avan and the Likud, they agreed on several things. One of them was that by August, okay, of 2020, they will pass a dual year budget for 2019, 2000, uh, for 2020 and 2021. And that was in order to ensure the rotation between Netanyahu and Gantz. That was the, the only, uh, I would say, guarantee that Gantz had in order to, to rotate with Netanyahu. What actually happened from a day after they signed, after, after the government was sworn oath to, to the state of Israel, Netanyahu and the Likud party tried to dissolve this, uh, this agreement and to change it. Suddenly, there was no ability, you know, to pass, to pass a budget. They need to work on it now. They had, you know, if we'll, if we'll go to 2019, you know, we had, we had a government before the election. We had a government after the election. It's not like there is a vacuum. And, and uh, Moshe Kahlon, who was the finance, the minister of finance, could have had a had a budget ready already, but Netanyahu refused to pass it. So, so let, me, let me understand something. We had a promise uh, through that agreement between Likud and Blue and White to pass a biannual budget for 2020, 2021. And that was supposed to happen back in August. Now this is December. Why are we having this crisis now if it had supposed, supposed to be done in August? So in August, um, um, how, Tzvi Hauser, one of the MKs who was a part of Kahol and uh, Blue and White, and then he 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 banned Kahol Blue and White and formed a new uh, party called Derech Eretz uh, with Yoaz Handel because both of them are right wingers and they left because they didn't want uh, Benny Gantz to to form a minority government with the with with the support of the joint list of the of the Arabs. Um, he came up with a proposal that they will make another adjustments in the, in the, in the basic law of the Knesset, and they will get an, an extension of 100 days with a deadline that the budget will be ready by December 23rd, and they will vote on that budget for 2020, 2021 on December 23rd. After they passed this extension, which once again, it was abusing the basic law and, and changing it again. Um, the, you know, the, the, minister, the current minister of finance, Israel Katz, started coming up with excuses 
that they cannot uh, pass a dual lang- a, a bi- bi-yearly budget. So, so had- the state of Israel is, is going on this um, lack of budget, working off of the 2018 budget for a couple of years now. But let me ask you, the bone of contention here was not the budget. They didn't have any fiscal disagreements between Blue and White and Likud. What no. was the problem? Why was uh, the budget not passed, even though this is in the best interest of the people and the state of Israel? So there are two things, two factors here. The first one is Netanyahu's will to control everything. Netanyahu, uh, he, he's really close to become an authoritarian uh, ruler. And he wants to have the control on everybody, including the gatekeepers. So he was refusing, and, and in Israel you have almost 106, 160 uh, senior exe- you know, executives, uh, state executives, that are not uh, being nominated because- uh, but Netan- I, have, I have to push back a little bit, Kobe. You're saying authoritarian, sure. but he does have um, major supporters within the Israeli public. He, his party was voted due to him as the largest party in Israel. He could not have done anything without the support of his members of Knesset. So in a way, I think that his control, may, as, as disagreeable as it, as it is to many, he is a, a legitimate ruler of Israel, even though we may disagree with what he's doing. The question is, why was he not willing to go ahead with the budget? What was the problem? I'm not saying that he wasn't elected. I'm saying that the way he rules, it has, a, has authoritarian uh, ways of uh, ruling. That's, that's what I'm saying. Okay, he was elected, uh, you know, in, in, in the Israeli democracy, and he played by the rules, by the way, you know, he was able to form a coalition uh, with, uh, you know, with uh, Benny Gantz. But the other thing, and by the way, you're talking about his supporters. We need to remember that Prime Minister Netanyahu has uh, three cases of corruption and uh, um, breach of trust. Um, and bribery. Standing, stand, and bribery, standing in courts. And they're actually, uh, they're starting the... the, the Official part of this of the of the um, of the trials in in February, Netanyahu was doing everything he can to stop those first the investigations. If we'll go back, you know, he he told his people, "Lo yeklum ki en klum." There's not going to be anything because there is nothing. Suddenly now there is nothing, but he's I trying. Think, Bobby, I have to understand something. What does that have to just explain? Because it's very difficult yes. to understand. What does that have to do with the budget? So the budget was just the excuse. Netanyahu wants to remain prime minister. He never had the the honesty, you know, to really uh, be obligated to his rotation treaty with with Gantz. He wants to stay in power as prime minister alone. And the only way, if they would have passed the the dual the dual year, the dual, the bi yearly yeah. budget, okay, then in that case, if they will go to election by the coalition agreement, Gantz would have become the the transition government uh, prime minister. So you're saying that the budget uh, issue was just a tool. By used by Netanyahu in order not to uphold the agreement with blue and white that would yes. have forced him to uh, go ahead with the rotation agreement with Benny Gantz and give him the premiership. Okay. So this was all just a ploy by Netanyahu to make sure that that agreement does exactly. not come to be. Exactly. Isn't that incredibly irresponsible for a country that's going through COVID-19? and that faces economic strife for years without a budget. I mean, is it really the, that bad a case, Kobe? I think that it's a tragedy that the state of Israel, you know, our startup nation is facing sh- such a poor leadership and su- such a bunch of poor politicians that are playing out of their own interests uh, in the people of Israel. You know, this government was formed as a Corona crisis um, government. I remember that Netanyahu used to stand every evening after the election and was calling Gantz. So he was saying, 
I'm calling Benny Gantz to join me so we can fight the COVID together. Nothing happened with COVID. All of the decisions made are made, you know, not as a policy, but as a byproduct of something. And even the leaders, by the way, talking, you know, if we'll go back to Prime Minister Netanyahu, he is not uh, once again obeying the rules that he's uh, putting on the people. So then, you know, the people are less obedient to what the state is saying. But, but Kobe, you're saying poor leadership. But let me ask you this. People look at Israel from outside and they yes. see the vaccines. Um, Israeli citizens are already getting vaccinations as we speak. Where oh, that's, a good, no, that's good that you're no, bringing it. Know. And the second thing is um, we have the peace agreements that had been signed, the normalization agreement between Israel and various countries in the Arab world. That doesn't look like poor leadership, does it? I, I, would, I would debate, I would argue on that. I think that the normalization agreements, they are very important for the state of Israel, but those are eventually, uh, I would call it, a, um, I would call it a interest accords because it's based on a, share, a shared interest, it's, which is great, but it, it still doesn't solve our problems. I mean, Israel's problems are way bigger than if it will have an agreement with the Bahrain and the, and the, the Emirates and Morocco, by the way, if we'll go back to 1993 and 1994, the, the, peop the, the people who started the normalization with them without official accords yet were uh, Itzhak Rabin and Shimon Peres. Right. That's yep. one thing. Yep. That's the other thing is, you know, when, when, uh, when Netanyahu, who, who is a great, by the way, he's, a, he's the best PR guy around, seriously. I honestly think that even President Trump took lessons from him before he started his, uh, his uh, career as a politician. But if you, if you look at it, he's talking about peace for peace, okay? It doesn't dissolve the Palestinian problem, which uh, Israel is are easy to, you know, to ignore it at the moment. But it's like, I would say that it's like, um, it's, like um, it's like a mold and it's growing. And we are ignoring it, you know, because it's convenient to us because uh, terror is, you know, in its lowest strengths in the last couple of years, which is a great achievement of the, of the defense forces, which are actually collaborating with the Palestinian Authority. So, so Kobe, I, I heard but, from you just uh, because this is a fascinating topic and I would love to have this conversation yes. about the, the political process and the agreements. But yeah, the, and let's go to the corona. Yeah, no, just to explain the, the main issue here. So right. we have the elections coming up in March and we understand that there was a rotation agreement that Netanyahu was not willing to move right. ahead with for various reasons. Is he the only one to blame for this or is Benny Gantz and Blue and White were also... I, 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 I will say that. I mean, uh, I think that uh, Benny Gantz himself, you know, is a tragic uh, character because he's the only one who really entered politics in clean hands, saying, you know, I'm putting the state in front of everything. And he proved it even yesterday when after they dissolved the Knesset, uh, he was helping Netanyahu uh, to add some budget to the economy, even though they haven't passed a yearly budget. And he was doing the best he can, you know, to, to hold this agreement alive and to hold this government alive. Um, and he was played. I mean, Gantz, I, th I think that his heart is pure, but he doesn't understand politics. And if you're coming to a fist fight with gloves, when the you know when when your opponent is coming with the spikes, then it's not a fair fight, and you either you know you you either need to step back or don't enter the ring in the first place. And I honestly think that Gantz, maybe he thought that he can do better in other ways that were not tried before, but I would argue on that because I would say you had plenty of people to check with them that tried and said, oh, uh, Bibi is changing, you know, it's a different Netanyahu. But I'm, I'm asking, you know, I'm thinking about what you're saying. And before the uh, third round, we had Benny Gantz as a major contender. Right. And now we're looking at the polls and we're seeing him at a mere 4% compatibility to Premier. Yes. At the same time, the people breathing uh, down the neck of Netanyahu right now are Naftali Bennett, supposedly of, of the Jewish Home Party, Yamina. Yamina. And then you have... Um, and then you have Gidon Saar, who left Likud, who is right. was 
part of, you know, hardcore Likud and who is creating, has created his own party. So you have two contenders to the right of Netanyahu, which is something that he has never faced before. So I agree that I think that the, in these elections, the, elect, the, the challenge for Netanyahu is tripled, actually. Uh, I don't think that, that uh, Bennett is such a big challenge, but Gidon Saar is definitely a challenge because he, he's a part, he's, a, he's the Likud's blood. And with him, it really is all personal. And you know that he's a right wing. He's not trying to blink to the left. He's not trying to put himself as a center. He's saying, I'm a hardcore right, but I'm coming to replace Netanyahu. And by the way, that's what hurt uh, Naftali Bennett, who was playing, you know, all around saying, I'm in opposition, but he wasn't speaking clearly that he is here, you know, to become Netanyahu's successor and to be the one that, that forms the next government. So Netanyahu will have to fight in, 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 different, in different areas. I actually think my hunch is that he's going to take more uh, focus now on the right wing, especially, by the way, on Gidon Saar, because that's his biggest challenge. Um, <clears throat> and we'll start seeing, you know, dirt coming up on Saar suddenly out of nowhere. <laughs> And those, um, spikes, those spikes on the hands. Oh, definitely. You know, uh, they will start uh, putting rumors uh, on, on Twitter and stuff and then go and prove that you don't have a sister, as we say right. in Hebrew. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that takes me back to the, the issue you raised before, because you have Naftali Bennett, who is right wing. You have Gidon Saar, who is right wing. You have Benjamin Netanyahu, who is supposedly right wing. Right. So all in all, if you count the right block in the Knesset, you reach about... 80 members of Knesset, whereas the left and the Arabs hold about 40. And the question yeah. is, what does that say about the political divide in Israel? Have we lost any ideological debates uh, in favor of pro-Netanyahu, anti-Netanyahu? Because I'm still young yeah. enough to remember the lovely 90s when we had those ideo ideological, ideological clashes. Yes. And suddenly, did it vanish? Where did it go? So I, I would say that uh, after the murder of Yitzhak Rabin in 1995, um, the center left, as, as they like to call it now, uh, lost its, uh, its uh, backbone. And they started, you know, they started uh, to being nice to the right wing on one hand, and nobody was responding to the critics. Because look, it's really hard to defend your ideology when you have dead bodies, you know, uh, all around the state of Israel. And, and, uh, and so you're, when, when somebody else has a case and it's harder to defend your case, sometimes you will tend to lose it or, you know, will not defend it. And it started with that and it went along with other things. And what I, I think that the biggest tragedy is that in Mapai, the old Mapai, the they had a saying, of La Shilton Bhartanu, okay? We were chosen to, go, to, um, to rule. And they kept on believing that, that you can do nothing from the opposition. If you are the opposition, you are not, uh, you are not doing anything. And if I'll, I'll give the credit to Netanyahu on that, he was able to prove that if you can be an efficient opposition and not such a, I would say, dardale, you know, like a lame opposition, like, for example, uh, Buzi Herzog, who had 24 mandates and did nothing with them as opposition, but always trying to go and, and form a coalition with Netanyahu. That's the reason that we have such a lame center left now, because they were always trying to be nice and compromise when the other side is not compromising on its, on its values. Okay. Look how hard Netanyahu is sticking to the ultra-Orthodox, to Shas oh, and Abuja. Wait, I, I want to challenge you on the values issue. Sure. And Netanyahu, supposedly the right wing is in power, and he gave up the uh, applying, uh, applying Israeli law in the West Bank. He, he is under heavy criticism by leaders of the settlers for freezing settlements. Um, he has done so in the past. Is this really about values or is this about survival, Kobe? I would say that it's all about money. It's about money and interests. Uh, when, you are, when you are ruling, okay, you have a lot of mouths to feed and a lot of interests to, uh, you know, to a lot of people to compromise. 
And what Netanyahu is doing, he compromises his allies, like the ultra-Orthodox, and by the way, the settlers too. If you will see what's going on, even though they have the, agree the disagreement on the annexation, and you know, uh, and, um, and what to do with the J Judea and Sumeria, uh, Netanyahu keeps on building in the, in the West Bank, okay? And he's keeping uh, strengthening our hold uh, by building infrastructure and uh, new and, and, and expanding territories, you know. So it's not that he's not doing it. He's not doing it the way they want to, but he keeps on doing it. And the fact that, you know, you know, if we'll go to the ultra-Orthodox, Arya Derry said that he's gonna, you know, he's gonna guard the disagreement, you know, this coalition with his, uh, with his own body. Well, I, Where I, is he I, now? Just to, just to explain to our viewers, Arya Derry, yes, Arya Derry the, the head of Shas. The Orthodox Party Shas came on the news and said, I urge Benny Gantz and Blue and White to join this, uh, this government. I will guarantee it personally. personally. I vouch that yes. this agreement will be actually upheld by both parties. Yes. And eventually both Shas and Aguda, okay, you know, I, I, would, I would ask in their case and the settlers, where are your Jewish values, okay? Forget now the ideology. Is your ideology is only money for your, for your narrow interests or we have a whole state to, you know, to, to, to maintain? And now, Bobby, I, I want to ask you, using your uh, superior political understanding and analytical yes. skills, we're looking at the elections coming up this March. Benny Gantz has lost. Uh, it doesn't right. seem like he's going to be resurrected. Netanyahu faces two adversaries on the right, who has Bennett and Saar. And then the other, uh, it seems that the arena is completely fractured. You have okay. Yesha Seed and Yari Lapid. You have other names that come up in the stock exchange of politics. So with such a split opposition to Netanyahu's rule, are we about to see him emerging again as prime minister? Or what do you think the chances are for what they say 2020A and 2020B, uh, another round of elections come later on this year in 2021? I think it's too early to, you know, to, to give, a, to give a, um, I would say, a prophecy about how the elections will turn out. But at the moment, the odds are in favor of Netanyahu uh, because Saar is the only one who's a, a little bit challenging him. If we'll check the polls of, of this past week, the Likud still gets almost 30 mandates, which means one out of four voters says he's going to vote for Netanyahu. And, and, uh, and um, Saar is actually getting 20 mandates. It, it will continue changing all the way, and especially when we don't know how the final lists of the parties will look like. I think that, you know, it will get more interesting uh, in, in February 4th, because that's the deadline to, uh, to, um, to hand the, the lists to, um, to the election committee. And starting then, we can actually debate on whose chances are bigger. But until then, we're going to continue seeing, you know, MKs drifting, members of the Knesset drifting from one party to the other, forming new parties, uh, joining forces with between parties. I actually think, you know, that if uh, if Saar and Bennett, both of them, really want to uh, replace Netanyahu, they need to join forces. But I don't see it happening once again. First, because of ego. And the second thing is that both of them see themselves as the successors of Netanyahu. So if one will have to, you know, uh, give the uh, the bhorah, the, you know, the first place to the other, I don't see how yeah, it's going to work out. I think you have a bigger issue here because you have Saar who already came in front of the cameras in Israel and said, if right. you want Netanyahu to be premier, don't vote for me. And Bennett has cons consistently and continuously refused to commit so. Right. Uh, well, we are, we are, uh, we're recording Wednesday, and to today uh, Bennett is actually going to have a press conference. We don't know what he's going to say. Most likely he's going to announce himself also as a, uh, you know, as a Netanyahu's successor. I don't see how it's going to help him that much because, because Gidon Saar, that was the first thing he said, okay? So he put himself out there, and now Netan Bennett is going to be looking like someone who, you know, He's following, uh, he's following Saar. 
I actually think that the best thing for both of them will be to join forces uh, against Netanyahu, but because otherwise they will both join Netanyahu. I mean, uh, at the moment, I don't see any alternative to a right-wing uh, ultra-orthodox uh, a coalition forming in the but, next day. But the day. chances are, when you're saying joint forces, they can either do it before or they could do it after the elections, bearing in mind how many seats they win in the Knesset and then maybe pose an opposition, don't you think? Yes and no, because uh, the Israeli tradition is that uh, the, the, chair, the head of the biggest, the largest party is the one who gets the mandate from the president to form the coalition first. Well, even on that issue, there are those who say that it's not necessarily the largest, but I agree. has most chances or the ability to create a coalition, right? I agree, because if we'll go back to 2008, when it was uh, Netanyahu and Tsipi Livni, then Kadima party had 28 mandates, the Likud only had 27, but Tsipi Livni had no one to, uh, to recommend her as the one to form the coalition, and Netanyahu was able to form a coalition. Even the Labour Party, by the way, and Meretz did not recommend Tsipi Livni at that time, and she was at the largest party. So you are right, but that's the tradition. I mean, you, you always have the, um, you know, the unique uh, cases, um, but, but, you know, the, the, Saar and Bennett can come to the coalition, you know, in theory at the moment, yes? Uh, with a lot more power, because Netanyahu used to spoil his allies on, on you know, instead of his uh, uh, Likud uh, members. So he, they can come with a lot more power. If we'll take Bennett, okay, Bennett had two mandates when, when he joined Netanyahu <laughs> as, as, a, as Minister of, the, of, of, the, of Defense. Right. So it's like uh, four. Sorry, not two mandates. He right. had four. Right. I'll 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 end with a quick um, a quick question. Um, maybe last sentence from you, Kobe, about yes. the um, impossible Israeli reality. So even though Benny Gantz and Netanyahu are butting heads, and we've seen what we've seen, they are locked together now in a what we call the transitional government mm -hmm. yes. until a new government is established in Israel. Right. It's something that could, could take months. So these two have to continue working together. Now it's December, elections are in March, yes. and you're still going to take time until a coalition. Until May or June. So you're talking about, what, six months more year, yeah. of, a, of a coalition between these two people, and they still have to function as a government. Government. Function or malfunction? I think that the Israeli, the Israeli public got used to an, a malfunctioning uh, government, unfortunately. Um, I think that the challenges of this government are huge. I mean, you're, you're reminding the, the, you know, corona, the corona crisis, and now we got uh, some vaccines. By the way, nobody knows the, the exact number of vaccines, but I can tell you that uh, anarchy is ruling. Um, my parents are on the, you know, the risk, the, are, are the, belong to the people at risk. And they called the, you know, the local, um, the local uh, service provider. And they told them, yeah, uh, we, we can put you at the end of February to get the vaccines. Uh, there is no pr real priority in Israel. There are a lot of, there is a big balagan. As, as we say, <laughs> and unfortunately, it doesn't seem that, uh, that, that the politicians or a specific politician cares about it. I think uh, the word Balagan is a great summary of our wonderful conversation today, Kobe. I want to thank you. It's always a pleasure having you and listening to your analysis. I look forward to our future conversations. I know we're going to have many of those as the election is near, and of course, the post-election analysis. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Shachar, and thank you to our viewers. Uh, it was a pleasure uh, being here with you. And thank you all for watching. And to all, we say stay safe and stay healthy. I'd like to thank our director, Sloan Copeland, JBS's managing director, Dara Golob, our technical manager, Michael Paley, transmission manager, John McDevitt, and to our producer of In the News, the wonderful Carol Lilienthal. For JBS, I'm Shachar Azani. Until next time, see you soon and later.